Colorado ski areas couldn't buy snow to start the year. Today, some of them lost money because of it. Monarch and A Basin had to close because it wasn't safe for people to come and go in those areas. Crested Butte had to delay opening some lifts to allow for avalanche mitigation. Slides shut down sections of I-70 today at Vail Pass and on both sides of the tunnel. That trapped drivers, including our Noel Brennan. It's going to be all day. All day. Sorry. It's going to be an all day thing. It's going to be all day. All I can tell you is. At the roadblock near Georgetown. All day is all I can tell you. We're going to be closed all day. All day? All day. Mike Pendleton was the guy with all the answers. <laughs> no. Even if those answers. Yeah. By far not. Were not what drivers wanted to hear. It's closed all day. I'm not sure when. While Mike directed people and traffic. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. No. Just down the road, CDOT worked to clear several feet of snow from the interstate. Avalanches are going across the highway like this isn't Alaska, dude. Nah, dude, but Colorado sure felt like it. Cold, freezing, roads being blocked for so long. So long that nature finally called. She had to go potty, I had to take her out. For one of Stevie Valandingham's dogs. Say hi. But definitely not the other. You, you can't stay here, sorry. Unless you guys want to be sleeping in each other's lap, I suggest you. <laughs> As CDOT moved back the closure, it can be closed all day. Mike Pendleton ran out of cars to direct. Thank God. And started thinking about his own. We're trying to get to Silverthorne. That was stuck in the closure, too. Yep. We were hoping we could turn our yellow light on and get by all of it, but no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> not even for the guy with all the answers. You go get a coat on, for crying's sake. For next, I'm Noel Brennan. Thank you. Mike Pendleton, thank you for working hard out there. I-70 opened up late in the afternoon. If you're headed up tonight or you're headed back down tonight or you're watching next on your DVR later, please do check the current conditions on CDOT's website. I'm Steve Stager. The latest development in the RTD train saga came at a city council meeting in Wheat Ridge. RTD's general manager, Dave Genova, gave the Wheat Ridge Council an update on the G Line. That's the train that will connect Wheat Ridge to Union Station. It was supposed to open last fall still not open and that's because the federal railway administration wants rtd to get its stuff together with the a line to the airport first the a line is having issues with crossing arms the feds have given rtd and its partners until february 4th to figure it out Geneva told the wheat ridge council that rtd will probably have to go to washington for another waiver and that means the g line is still on hold and rtd says there is no timetable for when it might launch it's frustrating to council members like Zach Urban, who went to voters for a sales tax hike to improve the area around the tracks. It puts an egg on our face when we've asked voters to uh, pony up on a sales tax increase to help fund improvements for uh, an area to improve what we see as a boon for our city, uh, but yet we don't have a train to offer them to catch when uh, at the same time. Now the Wheat Ridge Council is pushing RTD to produce a timeline. They say there has to be one. I spoke with RTD today. They say there is no timeline. I also spoke to the president of the Wheat Ridge Chamber today. She says the delay is frustrating, but she pointed out she doesn't think it's driving away developers who are used to these kinds of delays in projects. Yeah, you think that they're playing for the long game, even if they're frustrated now. The long game. All yeah. the stuff is there. Mm -hmm. They figure these developers are used to delays in construction anyway, so they yeah. might as well be used to a delay in this. Just a, a cascade of issues for RTD. Steve, thank you. So now, if federal regulators don't allow RTD that extended waiver for the A-line, then the train to the plane itself could be forced to shut down. I sat down today with RTD spokesman Nate Curry, and we began with a familiar question. Spokesman Nate Curry, thanks for coming by. Glad to be here. So, uh, I don't even have to ask you the first question. <laughs> the train is running well today, Kyle. <laughs> it's running well. Very nice. <laughs> Sadly, minutes after the taping of this interview, the RTD A-Line had signal issues resulting in delays of 15 to 20 minutes. The same technical issue that's been plaguing the train since its launch. Did RTD buy a product that doesn't work? That's, uh, that's a great question. There is no Microsoft uh, Windows 95 that you could just take off the shelf and buy it, right, uh, like this. And so this software is being designed from scratch and has never been done before. So it's, um, it's something we had to do. Um, and it's been a challenge. Is there any chance that when you guys go to the feds and ask for this extension, they will say no, shut down the A-line? There's always that chance, and, and I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, pretend any decision they make. We don't think that will happen. Um, you know, we've been working very closely with them, and, and they're great partners of ours. Has anybody been held accountable? Uh, accountable how? That's, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, as far as people being fired, no. 
Uh, I think that's largely a, um, a function of, of the way contracts are written and, and being a government agency as well. Um, a lot of the people that were responsible for this decisions being made a long time ago are no longer around. And so it's tough. I think you've, what, we, what we've got at RTD is a whole new generation that, of, of leadership that's coming into this and inheriting uh, a challenge, um, probably the biggest professional challenge we've ever had in our lives, and really looking for quick solutions that, are, that make sense uh, to get this thing running like it was intended, like it was promised. You know, those of us coming into RTD super excited about this process are just as disappointed and, and frustrated as the, the rest of the public because we love this stuff. I mean, it, I moved back here to Colorado to, to work on this and, mm -hmm. and I've been following this my entire life. So having this stumble like it has uh, is disappointing for me personally too. Uh, one final question. How many times a week while watching Next are you tempted to pick up your television and physically throw it across <laughs> the room? Let me just say this. Every time you mention us, um, I'm well, I don't even need to be watching because I get lots of texts and tweets and um, Nate, how you doing? Kyle's talking about you again. <laughs> so. I hope you know. I hope you know. We wish you success. I know you do. Um, and our goal is your goal, which is a world-class train system that serves this community well. Yeah. Uh, and I wish you luck in getting there quickly. Thanks, man. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Nate. Yep. Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks, Kyle. You bet. All right. Governor Hickenlooper said today that the A-Line's issues will be a distant memory someday. But on this day, even the governor acknowledged his frustration. I'll say I'm disappointed. I think everybody is disappointed. I mean, the A-Line was that grand triumph that, that you know, uh, connected downtown Denver to the airport, but also connects all parts of the metro area to the airport. And I think the A-Line, you know, five years from now, we're not even going to remember how frustrating it's been and how disappointing it was that it is going to have a major positive impact on kind of defining that this, you know, well, the, the, the metropolitan Denver, but, but Colorado. And we at Next tend to agree. The A-Line's reliability has improved. It's 89 to 90% on time at this point. That's short of RTD's goal, but it is a significant improvement from where it was at the start. Until the train to the plane, though, meets the goals that were laid out for the public, for riders, and for federal regulators watching its performance, we here at Next will keep riding it, so to speak. The next time that Arapahoe County Sheriff's Deputy Bill Foreman pulls someone over, that driver may think they're having the worst day ever. Deputy Foreman has seen worse days. Like the day in February, he nearly died in a crash as he responded to a murder scene. After nearly a year of physical therapy and time in the hospital, he returned to work today. Coming back to work is, is a positive step forward. I was in a crash. I bled out. I died. It took five minutes of CPR to bring me back. I've gone through six surgeries. I've been out until last week, almost 11 months on workman's comp. And I don't know that I'll get back to a position where I was before the crash. Uh, my name uh, is Deputy William Foreman. I've been with the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office uh, for 26 years now. Once I woke up and realized what had happened, there was no doubt in my mind that I was I was not going to be back in this building. And realistically, I knew that given the severity of my injuries, there would probably be limitations. Getting caught up on a, probably one of 160 or so training modules that were waiting for me. What helped me get through this was all the people that I work with, my coworkers, my friends, my family. I had prayer chains all over the United States. They didn't know me. All they knew was that I was a police officer who'd been involved in a crash. It's very humbling. Some people would say it's the perfect excuse to, to retire, to give up, but I didn't get in this, this line of work to give up. But as long as there's still somebody out there that needs a police officer, I've got something to do. Denver's new district attorney's been sworn in for all of two hours, but we're already talking about how she'll handle police officers who don't follow the law. Neither snow nor rain nor risk of avalanche stops the pizza guy making deliveries along I-70. Once we figure out we can get up there, then we do it. A snow day for a ski resort. We look into just how rare that is in Colorado. 
The Nine News Weather app has your forecast now, but if you can't find your apps with both hands, we'll dig into the details next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is the pizza guy making deliveries to truckers stuck on I-70 in the snowstorm. One driver stuck on Vail Pass decided to order a pizza. We're told it was pepperoni and pineapple with extra cheese. And the owner of Chicago Pizza in Vail, Mark Seleski, says these truckers are great customers for him, so he couldn't leave that guy and others hanging. I think great times getting up there and, and dealing with these guys. It looks like the photo that you have there is the first guy that I did. Um, today, and he was actually east of the Vale, East Vale exit, and it was kind of tough to get up there. Perhaps you notice Mark's wearing shorts there. He says he's pretty much exclusively a shorts guy. He does work in an 85-degree kitchen. Mark kind of makes you proud to be a Coloradan, you know, and, and so does, in a funny way, the fact that we got so much snow, it has been closing ski resorts this week. Crested Butte was the first. It closed yesterday. We had a tough time remembering the last time that happened, and you know what? So did a representative from Crested Butte. Not since I've been here, uh, since 2010, and actually, uh, and speaking to some others, they, they don't recall it either. And my family's been in the ski resort um, industry since 1982, and we've never had to shut down a ski area. So pretty crazy. But we did get a lot of snow, and we did have to close the mountain, and it was pretty unusual. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it a bad thing. Most of Crested Butte was reopened today. The extreme terrain is still closed until tomorrow because they like to be in the skiing business, not the tempting avalanches business. Too much snow at your favorite resort. What a problem to have, right? Monarch dealing with the same issues as was a basin earlier today. I'm meteorologist Kathy Sabin. It's a beautiful night in the city. Still a little windy out there, but nothing like yesterday. Those westerly Chinook winds pushing temperatures above average this afternoon. We'll enjoy that for one more day. And here comes the next storm and the next round of blowing snow. High avalanche danger and that wind warning is extended out again for travelers on I-25 tonight and tomorrow. So not done with the wind or the snow. As a matter of fact, a winter storm warning posted for the high country could see another foot of snow between now and probably midday on Thursday. So be prepared for that. If you can get up there, it's going to be amazing. Oh, the moisture pipeline is here. All that moisture coming in off the Pacific, driven by the jet stream. And that means mountain snow and wind and relatively mild weather here in Denver. Partly cloudy 30 in the city tonight. A bit of wind west of town. Not as blustery as the last two days. And then 52 tomorrow. Sunshine. A little cooler for the end of the week. And maybe some flurries in Denver on Thursday night into Friday. Nice weekend warming trend. Another chance for snow Sunday into Monday. Beautiful cloud pictures coming in tonight. Thank you all for sending those in. Thank you, Kathy. Denver District Attorney Beth McCann. It's official now. She took the oath two hours ago. In the state legislature for years, McCann was known as a progressive Democrat who opposed the death penalty and pushed gun control. She tells next that Denver will not be seeking the death penalty on her watch, and she's looking forward to aggressively prosecuting gun crime. I'm very uh, anxious to be aggressive in prosecuting gun violations. Uh, we have too many guns uh, in our city. Too many illegal guns, too many legal guns. We have so many homicides that are simply someone having a gun available, uh, that something that could be prevented. Do you believe that Colorado's Make My Day law is being correctly assessed and implemented in cases, or would you change the way that those considerations are given to Denver residents? So I don't see any big change coming in that, in that arena. I mean, I will follow the law. Uh, the law gives people in certain situations the right to use lethal force, and we will follow that. Are there Denver police officers who are getting away with breaking the law while on duty? Um, I don't know that I can say that without actually looking at factual, you know, a factual rendition of what happens. I know there's a perception that that occurs, but I'm not in a position at this point to say yes or no. Should beat cops be worried about District Attorney Beth McCann? No, I'm fair. 
I am uh, responsible. I will handle the case just as I would other cases and see whether or not there is evidence of a law being broken. And if there is, I'll bring the case. So you've said that one of your priorities as district attorney will be to conduct a review of the DA's office to, quote, rid it of implicit bias. Yes. So if, if implicit bias, by its very definition, is subconscious, yes. how do you intend to root <laughs> it out? Um, Interesting question. So we will be doing um, tracking in our office of race and gender and sexual orientation um, of cases and comparing how we're treating people of different genders or different races. I'm also planning to have cultural competency training for everyone in the office so that we begin to understand uh, how our own biases may impact our daily decision making. It's not treating people more gently. It's treating them consistently. So, you know, if you have someone with a similar record that's one race and you have another person of a similar record of a different race and they're charged with the same offense, they should be treated equally. So it's really, it's not, um, it's not we're going to go easy on people, it's we're going to be consistent. Newly elected district attorney from Denver, Beth McCann, congratulations. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. You have questions, we have answers. And this week, you're very curious about whether the closure of Colorado's oldest Italian restaurant might impact the meals we make at home. And whether the goat seen going berserk on old Christmas trees on necks might experience some seasonal side effects. Our next question is a saucy one. That is a terrible pasta pun, because Scott Rapluski and Hannah Bruner and all the others of you who wrote to us just have a serious question. With Louisville's iconic Blue Parrot restaurant closing after nearly a century in business, what happens to the Blue Parrot pasta sauce that's sold in all those grocery stores? And the owner of the Blue Parrot told us today, fear not all you lovers of the sauce. It's the 98-year-old restaurant's recipe that is made by an outside manufacturer and then sold under its name and logo, and she says it should continue to be sold in stores after the Blue Parrot closes its doors on January 22nd. A follow-up to someone that we met in our search for the smartest kid in Colorado. Kevin Wang is back home from his trip to Atlanta to compete in the national math competition. The Fairview High School senior was one of just 10 high school students chosen from across the country to compete in the American Mathematical Society's Who Wants to Be a Mathematician contest. He's competing for a $10,000 prize, and while Kevin did not bring home the cash, he will forever have our mad respect for stumping me badly with a math question live here on the air. His future is clearly bright. And our search for the smartest kid in Colorado continues. If you have a good lead for us, email next at 9news.com or get our attention anytime with the hashtag HeyNext. So you're dragging your Christmas tree out to the curb and a goat is like, you going to eat that? We learned this week on Next that goats in Colorado recycle Christmas trees. And here at Next, we are dedicated to answering your questions, whether they be about a billion dollars in public spending or the gastrointestinal twists and turns of animals. And a few of you asked, if the goats are eating Christmas trees, does that make their milk taste any different? Suppose that is a fair question. And the answer we found is yes, the milk would taste different. It would be kind of piney. At least that's what the owner of Jumpin' Good Goats Dairy in the high country says. But the farm in Buena Vista pointed out it's not milking the goats right this time of year. They're pregnant. It's not milking season. So there is no pine-flavored goat cheese on the market. We cleared up a lot of important issues in this segment. And we will get to your feedback on the events of today next. Your feedback now. Marissa writes, wait, I'm confused. Kyle isn't wearing a couch. Purple check not good enough for you. John B. writes, take everything said about the A-line train. It's the scrapped bag system at DIA. I asked today, John, is it salvageable? They said yes. Maybe I should have asked, is it salvageable by the pound? We'll work on that for next time.